Okay, so so what what code pin is? This is me, by the way. I am a dog with very large eyebrows. Not no, not really. I, that picture just makes me laugh every time I see it, <laughs> and I, I forget that I use it as my avatar. So I like load web pages and giggle every time. Uh, yeah, I'm Ben Ventrice. I work at a game company called Goldfire Studios here in Oklahoma City, and I also do some independent contracting. Um, I have been writing JavaScript for a while. I don't actually know now, probably 10 years or something. Um, outside of that, I've done a lot of other random stuff. I've coded C, C++, Python, Ruby, all this stuff. So my point about earlier when I was asking where everybody is and if they understand loops, control statements, and functions, the reason is almost every language has those concepts and if you understand those core concepts, this is my opinion. I have a strong opinion about this. If you understand those core concepts, most languages are pretty easy to learn because the idea of branching and having if statements and else statements and all that stuff is the same across languages. Like if you see an if statement in C, it's gonna be written and look very similar to an if statement in JavaScript. If you see an if statement in a bash script in Unix or Linux, it's the shape isn't exactly the same, like the syntax isn't exactly the same, but what it's doing is the same. Um, there are a few languages that don't run with these exact things. For example, uh, Prolog or Erlang or um, some other functional language like F sharp. I think F sharp might have if statements. I don't actually know. I haven't coded in it. Uh, but um, those use different mechanisms to do this control flow in, or branching. Um, so some of those will use things that look like a switch. Some of those use things, I think they call it pattern matching, which is where if you imagine a switch statement where there is like three cases, but there's like a default case where it could match anything. It's similar to pattern matching. So all of these concepts really boil down to computer science and discrete math stuff where it's like, what does, how do we, how do we control what the program is doing and how do we make decisions at runtime based on user input, right? Because that's what we're really trying to do, right? We're like, the, com the user put in three and two and we want to add two numbers. How do we do that? Right? So these are all syntactic decisions that people made about how to deal with input. Okay, so in the case of JavaScript, JavaScript is a, it is similar to C in that it's pretty procedural. It runs from top to bottom. Uh, but it also has the concept of functions or subroutines, so it can jump from one chunk of code to another. You can do that with an, a function call. Um, does everyone understand what a function is? Um, so if you have if you have a chunk of code where you add two numbers together and you want to you want to be able to use it over and over, you can pull it into a function and pass those numbers in per, as parameters. Okay, so CodePen is a nice tool that I use for a lot of my examples of stuff that I build. Um, like here's here's one random thing that like generates points and runs over and over, and I think it looks really neat. It's like a modern art generator thing. Um, but CodePen is nice because it is very visual and it's on the web, and you don't have to install anything to write some JavaScript that does something. So I'm going to make a new CodePen real quick so that we can look at some really basic JavaScript concepts, and then we're gonna move into the new things that ES6 provides for us. So the first thing you wanna do is open up this console. What the console is, is it is a thing, you can actually just open this on any web page. Uh, so let's, uh, let's just go to Woot, whatever, right? Okay, so this is Woot, they have computers and stuff. I don't know if I'm supposed to show this, whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, but you can actually just come in here and type document.query selector, and I want the body of the document, and there it is, right? There's the HTML body. 
you can you can do whatever you want. So if I wanted to do something really dumb, like I could be like var body equals that, and I could do like body dot inner HTML equals hello, <laughs> and it just oh yeah yeah sure. Let's see, can I? Yeah. So I literally just like in the in the console here wrote some JavaScript that grabbed the body of the document and replaced all of the HTML on the page with the string hello. So the console's really nice for if you're wanting to write some test stuff. Um, okay, so that being said, that console is the Chrome Developer console, but almost everything that runs JavaScript has a console. So let's write a hello world program in here real quick. We're gonna console log hello world. And you can see down there in the bottom, it logged hello world in the console, right? Cool. So if we want to make uh, an if statement, we can say var a equals one. If a is greater than two, we're gonna do something else we're going to do something else, right? So here we're going to console.log less, um, and then here we're going to console.log more. Uh, but more is not defined. It has to be a string. Okay, so we did that, right? And of course, one is less than two, so we're outputting less. Okay, so now we understand how an if statement works in JavaScript. Um, and then if you want a function, we can just make one, function print, where we take in a string and we console.log the string. Oh, yeah, sorry, I keep forgetting about that. There we go. Let's clear the console. Let's see if it'll keep scrolling with us. I should be able to move this over just slightly too. All right, there we go. Uh, so now if I say print hello, right? Oh, look at that, we wrote our own, uh, our own function. We can do anything we want. So if we wanted to take that string and always add uh, world to it, we can do that. So that's what a uh, function would be. So you could do whatever you want. You can also print goodbye world. Ooh, we did it. It's, it's cool. So that functions are about making reusable chunks of code. Um, now if you have a function that can call a function that can call a function, you can write large amounts of functionality that can be reused. The most common things we call those are modules or libraries. So does, ever, does anybody here know what NPM is? Uh, does, does anybody here know what Node is? Does everybody know what Node is? Nobody knows what Node is? Okay, Node is a, Node is a command line thing that lets you run JavaScript files from the command line. What that really means is you can run JavaScript on a server instead of on a web page. So using Node, you can write scripts in JavaScript that you can run on your computer like a program. It's really cool because that lets you write a web server and the web client in JavaScript. So you can actually have code, like functions that you've written that run both on the client and on the server. So that's really useful because you get to reuse a lot more code. Because there's gonna be stuff that you reuse over and over, like I wanna take a list of numbers and sum them, right? That's useful for a server to do and it's useful for a client to do. Then you can take that and abstract it into a library or module and put that on this thing called NPM, which has a huge list of modules that people have written. For example, there is a module on NPM called Express, which contains lots of useful functions for doing web serving. Um, so you can import the express module into your node script and write a web server very quickly. Uh, if you want to, I actually gave a talk on that in WebSockets not too long ago, so you can go look at that. Um, the reason I'm talking about all this stuff real quickly is because most of the ES6 features are building on these core concepts. So if I went straight into that, it's not really gonna make sense if you guys don't know what I'm talking about with these core concepts. All right, so all of that being said, uh, we can take a look at some of the new stuff that ES6 added. So let's, let's, let's go in here and hit the button. Where are you at, present, yeah. 
So we're going to make JavaScript all smooth. I, don't, I just thought that was funny. It doesn't really have anything to do with anything. So what we're going to talk about is all these things real quick. We're going to talk about new types of variable declarations. We're going to talk about string templating. So you guys saw where I added that string together. We're going to talk about a better way to do that. Uh, we're going to talk about destructuring, which I'll explain what that does when we get there. <laughs> the spread operator, which is a new operator. And by operator, I mean if you do A plus B, plus is the operator. Uh, if you do A plus plus, plus is also an operator, but we call it a unary operator because it is an operator that acts on a single operand. So there's only one input to the operator. It's not like one plus two, it is one plus plus, right? Um, in math, I think you can use the tilde to mean not or you know negate or whatever. That's also a unary operator. Um, we're going to talk about arrow functions, which is a shorthand way to write some other functions. Uh, to write functions, there is a slight change in behavior of how arrow functions work versus functions where you use the function keyword. And this can be a gotcha if you don't know, if you're not aware of it. Uh, we're going to talk about function parameters and how they changed in ES6. We added some niceties like default values and stuff like that. Uh, we're going to talk about classes. Um, JavaScript doesn't really have the concept of classes until ES6, but even then the ES6 classes are syntactic sugar around this other thing called prototypes. Um, JavaScript is considered a prototypal language, not an object-oriented language, because instead of using this abstract object thing, it has a concrete prototype that is cloned into new objects. So that's the big difference. Um, there's, some, there's some interesting stuff that happens with that, but we'll talk about that when we get there. Uh, we're gonna talk about getters and setters, which are basically, if you have an object and it has, uh, it has variables on the object, these are ways you can wrap the way that it either sets the variable or returns the variable. Um, and we'll talk about that more when we get there. We're going to talk about modules and how they changed in ES6. Um, we're going to talk about some of the new data structures that it added in ES6. So an example of a data structure in JavaScript is an array. There are new kinds of structures that are similar to arrays but do other things. Uh, uh, the first example would be a set, which is similar to array, but all the values in it have to be unique, which is kind of nice because let's say you have a list of logged in users and somehow they hit the login thing twice and you want to push their name in twice, it will just not push it in the second time. Like if you had an array, you'd have to go write that code yourself to be like, oh, the user's not, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, we're going to talk about some cool new array functions they added that let you do some for loops or some other stuff really quickly. Uh, and then finally, the two things that we're going to talk about with asynchronous JavaScript are promises and async await. Those are, those are probably the most complicated thing, but uh, they can be hyper useful when you're trying to write code for the UI that doesn't freeze when it's trying to do something that takes too long. So an example of that would be if a user clicks a button to go load an image, instead of the page just hanging and waiting for the image to load, you can tell it to just go try to fetch the image, and I'm gonna let my screen turn off again. Uh, go and fetch the image, and then keep doing whatever you were doing, and then finally when the image returns, then display it. That's really the gist of promises. Okay, so let's get started. Variable declarations. We have four ways maybe more, but four that I'm aware of, ways to declare variables in JavaScript. The first one is, you can just declare a variable and not put anything before it. Don't do this, but you can, and it makes a global variable. Now, when you're in, um, when you're in a browser, there's actually not global variables. Every variable is a variable on the window object. So if you say foo equals four, you actually made a thing where it's window.foo equals four. Um, 
Don't do this in general. There are a few cases where this can be useful, but in 90% of the time, it's this is bad because you're going to do something weird where like if you have a function that uses foo internally and you expect it to be a new empty variable, it won't be. Or you could like somehow overwrite something that this code is using over here and it's just bad stuff. Um, so what var does is it declares a variable that is function scoped. And what that means is if you have a function and you say var foo equals four, foo does not exist outside of that code. So if you try to call, uh, I'll just actually write an example real quick because, oh, that's not, that's not how that works. All right, so let's go into the pin here. So, oh, here's a good example. This, this function here has uh, string plus equals world. So this, this is not declaring a global variable because string was defined as a function parameter. But if we made a new thing in here, right, if we said foo equals string, right, down here we can say console.log foo. This should work. Uh, and yeah, see, so see how it printed goodbye world twice? That's because the first time it set foo to hello world, and then it set it to goodbye world. So the global foo got set twice, but it's only going to be the last thing that got set. So this is really, can run into some really weird stuff. But if we say var foo here, it's actually going to tell me that foo, well, it should have said something. Uh, foo. Let's see what this does. It should print foo and then what foo is. All right, well, it's not even running because foo's undefined in this scope. So if we did another thing here where we said var foo equals three, we're going to finally get it to print three, right? Because foo's not getting set. So finally, if we say var foo equals three up here, right? Foo is three. But if we get rid of the var here, it's going to overwrite that thing. And that's probably not what we want, right? We don't want all of these random functions touching our variables all over the place because you're going to like have a list of users or something and like some function is just going to delete it or you know, this is not what you want when you're coding. So yeah, almost always you're going to want to use something like var. Now the other two functions, the other two declaration types are more interesting. So we have one called let. Let me go ahead and go back to the slides. We have one called let, which declares a block scoped variable. And the difference between block scoping and function scoping is if you have a block scoped variable, it is defined within the curly braces that it's inside. If you have a function scoped variable, it is defined within the function even if it's within a set of curly braces. So I'll show what I mean here in a second. And then const acts exactly the same way let does, except you cannot uh, reassign it, which can be useful. Because if you have something where like, it come, you, know, you just want to define a thing and you don't want it to ever be changed, you can use const. Though if con you make an, a const object, you can change the sub items in the object. So if you have a const array, you can push things onto the array, but you can't change the, you can't reassign the array itself. Uh, if you want to have immutable objects where you can't change them at all, you have to go use a different module. All right, so what does this do? Let's go look at const real quick, or I'm sorry, let. So in this case, if we say let, oh, no, I'm sorry, if we say if, uh, well, let's just say if false, right? Here, and then we say console.log foo. Um, here we can see, <clears throat> let me delete some of this garbage that's everywhere. Okay. Um, all right, we can see foo's undefined here because fault that never ran, because if false doesn't run. But if we say if true, it will create a variable in the function scope. But if we change this to let, foo should be undefined again. Oh. Oh, I broke it. What is happening? 
oh yeah, it's not going to log anything because foo is undefined. Um, so it should log the string if I move this below here. Hold on. Yeah. So it's actually throwing an error. We don't see the error right now. But if I open this console, foo is not defined, right? Because in this case, this foo doesn't exist outside of these curly braces. And the reason why this is useful is because you get weird behavior if you don't expect it. So if you do a for loop, right? So you say var i equals zero, i is less than three, i plus plus, right? Oh, come on. Okay. This is the one thing I hate about CodePen is that sometimes if you don't, if you have the auto update thing set up and you don't put an end condition to a loop, it'll just try to run your code and then explode. Uh, so I'm just going to use a console down here. Plus, I think it'll be easier to read. All right, so we have, if we have a function, whatever. And okay, if we have a for loop, right? For var i equals zero, i i is less than three, i plus plus, and we console dot log i. What what should happen is it should print zero one two, right? Cool, but i is now defined in the scope. So if you try to do something like call a function in there and you're accessing i inside of the function, it can access the global scoped i and it might not get it until the end of the loop. So you're going to get i as 3 every time and some other weird, weird behaviors. This is one of the things people complained about with JavaScript a lot. So they changed it to let. And now, so, oh, well, let, me, um, let me refresh this so we're on a fresh thing. So if we come up here and change this var to let, the i is only scoped with inside of that, um, inside, of the, inside of the loop. i is not defined. Great. So this behaves the way, if you come from C or C++ or C Sharp or any of these other C-like languages, this means that it behaves the way you would expect it to. So most people in modern JavaScript, ES6, are only using let and const. They're, they don't even use var anymore. All right. So does that all make sense? Did anybody have any questions about that before we move on to the next thing? Okay, cool. Uh, we're going to talk about, oh, yeah, well, there's examples I had already written out apparently. That's cool. Uh, let's talk about string templating. So this, if you've used bash, probably looks kind of familiar. Uh, you can have strings where you can put a variable in the string and template the string to contain that variable instead of having to do concatenation. So you can actually um, have, um, uh, yeah, this template here, you can say hello foo. Since foo is a variable that exists in its scope and foo is equal to world, the string will now be hello world. So this, this is nice. It looks slightly better than let string equals hello plus, oh, hello, oop, let's not do that. Hello space plus foo, right? The second one, in my opinion, is a little more readable, especially if you're having to do something after it, because you have to put a space, blah, 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 you know, all this stuff. And here you can actually just put a space in whatever else you wanted to have. That's really nice. That's a convenience thing. If you define a function that returns a string, you can actually run that function as a template. So you just do it like this, template tag. Uh, and the main difference here for string templates is they are using a backtick instead of a single or double quote for the string. The back tick tells JavaScript, hey, this is a magical string that you need to parse as a template. So you can take this template ta tag function and then call it this way with the string template and have it do whatever you want. And this one actually will take the whatever you passed in as foo, as the second argument there, or I'm sorry, the f yes, the, f the argument there, and it will uppercase the first letter of it. So that's some really useful stuff. If you wanted to make a thing where it capitalizes every word in a sentence or something, you could do it like this. Um, 
In this case, what this strings variable is, is if we had something like this, right? So hello, comma, foo, and then there's some other text here. Text. Um, string zero inside of this is going to be hello, comma, up to the first variable. And then strings one is going to be the next chunk of string text that's outside the variable declaration. So you can actually put that in here like this, so strings one, right? Um, and does everybody understand this uh, array notation where I'm putting bracket zero, close bracket, for accessing items in an array? Okay, so let me go explain that real quick. So if we have var a equals one, two, three, four, uh, a at index one is the value two. Well, why is that? Because all arrays start at zero, so the first one is actually the zeroth one. So if you have that, well, so a zero through a three is the numbers we expect, one, two, three, four, and then at index three is the number four. Um, so that's how, that's basically how arrays work. If we say a dot push, we can add a value to it. So now a is five things long, it has a value three at index four, and it spits it out. So it's zero, one, two, three, four for the indices accessing those elements out of the array. Um, so let's go back to here. All right, cool. So that, that's basically all I know about string templates. There is probably a lot more interesting stuff you can learn about it. Um, if you want to delve deeper into any of this stuff, look at the MDN documentation. Uh, W3Schools is fine, but I have a thing that deletes W3Schools from my Google results for a reason. Um, so the next thing we're going to talk about is destructuring which is basically taking objects or arrays and ripping the insides out of them and putting them into other variables. Um, so does everyone understand what an object with object notation is in JavaScript? Let's go do one quick example about what that's doing. So if we say var obj is this, a1 comma b1, we're creating an object that has two properties on it called a and b, a is equal to one, B is equal to one. But in the global scope, we don't have A. Oh, we, we do because we made an array called A. And we don't have anything called B. It's undefined. It won't even let me type it in, right? Okay. But with destructuring, this is useful for if you have a function that takes in a configuration object and the object has a lot of properties on it and you don't want your function parameter list to be 20 things long. You're like, just give me a config object and I'll pull the things off of it I want. So there's a lot of times in React or other frameworks like that where you might get uh, an object called props in where you want two things off of props, but props might have 50 properties. You don't want to have to pass in every property separately. That's crazy. And then also this is just shorthand for doing something that you would probably be doing already. So let's go look at what how we would do that. So if we say var a equals obj dot a, and then we put com, uh, let's just do that, and then var b equals obj dot b, right? So this is the short, the longhand way of doing it. Now we have a and b, and they're both equal to one. The way you can, the other way you can do that is you can say var curly brace a comma b equals obj. And what that will do is it will create two variables called a and b, and assign them to the values of a and b on the object. So we can do that, and now we have a defined and b defined. So this is just a really nice shorthand way of taking an object and pulling properties off of it that you want to use. Um, you can do the same thing with an array. So if you want um, the first two items out of an array, you can say, you know, const or var a comma b in square brackets and that will um, destructure the array into these things. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is a spread operator, which is another form of array or object destructuring. So the spread operator is cool because let's say you want the first two things out of an array, but you don't care about the rest, but you do want to save it somewhere. 
So if we have an array, let's say var a is your array, and it has one, two, three, four, five, six in it, right? So now we want, we want two variables. We're going to call it a1, a1, and b1. And then uh, I think you can do this, rest, right? And what this should do is pull off a1 to b1, a2 to b, oh, I'm sorry. I don't know why I called that b1. b1 is the second one. And then rest is all the rest of the array. So if you have a function where you take in, I don't know, uh, yeah, the, there, are, there are things these are useful for. I don't have apparently great examples for their usefulness at this moment. So the spread operator can also let you combine objects. So if you, let's say you have two objects that you want to mix together. You want to add properties from one object onto another. We can, let me refresh this so that I have that. We can say var a equals an object and it has a and b on it. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and then we have an object called B that has the properties C and D on it. So now we have A, we have B, and we want to make an object C that is both of those mixed together. So you can actually say var C is equal to an object with the properties of A and the properties of B. So now if we hit C, we can see it's all of those properties together. So that's really useful if like, let's say you have two data sources, like you load the user from the session and you load the re their avatar image and some other things from the database, you wanna just smush those together, make it one object, you can do this. Uh, there's also object.assign, which is another way to do these kinds of things and you can clone and stuff like that, but this is a really quick, easy way to do it. Um, you can also use the spread operator to do the same thing for the arguments passed into a function. So if we have our function where we say function A and then everything else that gets passed in here, uh, and then we can console, console.log A, console.log rest. Right? So now if we call this function and we say one, two, three, four, well, oh, pfft. I, I actually have to name the function so that we can call it. We can't just call it function. I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, okay. Let's call it spread. So now if we say spread, one, two, three, four, right? We can see that A was the first parameter of the function and then all the other parameters got smushed into an array we called rest. This lets you create a function that has a variable number of inputs. So let's say we wanted to make a function where you can pass in two numbers and add them together, or three numbers and add them all together, or four numbers and add them all together, or five numbers and add them all together. In a lot of languages, you would just make overrides of the function where you'd be like, well, add is int a and int b, add three, is int a, int b, int c, add fours, right? I mean, and that's a lot of duplicated code. But in JavaScript, we can just say, give me all of the parameters and put them in an array, I'm gonna do whatever I want with them. So this is one of the ways that I enjoy writing in JavaScript because it gives you a lot of power, though it can make you do some goofy stuff sometimes, but it's great. So that's, that's the basics of the spread operator and the rest operator that lets you pull stuff off of that. Um, we can, does, I don't know if I'm going too fast, is everybody all right with the speed, we're, we're good? I'm not like, okay, cool. And feel free to like raise your hand or let me know if you have a question or something's not explained thoroughly because I don't wanna like, yeah. All right, so now we're gonna start getting into some of the nice shorty things where we define functions in other ways. So arrow functions, the main difference of an arrow function from a named function or anonymous function is the way that this works. And this in JavaScript is a K 
keyword that represents the context of the thing that's running. So what I mean by that is if we come in here and we say, we just type in this, it's going to give us window. So this is the root context. Now if we say function bar console.log this, we're going to get something else. Because in JavaScript, everything is function scoped. So when we run bar, oh, it shouldn't have been this. That's weird. Oh, I guess bar is running in. So yeah, bar is running in the context of window. Now, if we have a class or a prototype, so let's say we say var foo equals function foo. Okay, and then we say foo dot prototype dot bar is a function where we console dot log this. We're gonna say uh, var my foo is a new foo, and then we're gonna say foo dot bar. So that foo dot bar is Oh, I guess I have to define it without the var foo. Okay. And then redefine the prototype. Oh, foo's not defined. My foo dot bar. So we can see here when I log this, this here is foo, not the window. Now, if you run a function from another class inside of a function from this class, the this inside of that function is going to be the other things this. So that can cause some weird issues if you're using something like jQuery. Right? So you're like, hey, jQuery, when you go get this Ajax call, uh, please assign the value you got back to this dot my variable. Well, the problem is jQuery is like, well, this is me. This is, this is jQuery. So you just made jQuery dot variable equal to the URL and not your class. Arrow functions, on the other hand, will keep the context they were run in. So instead of having to say something like var self equals this, and then inside of your callback function you say self dot variable, you can just use this with the arrow functions and it's the this you expected. Um, so that's just a nice thing that the arrow functions do. Plus they're a lot shorter as you can see. You just, you just put a little pointy thing and it makes a function. Um, so in that top case, that's the exact same as saying uh, function curly brace or function parentheses curly brace console.log semicolon curly brace. If it's a one line function, it doesn't have to have the curly braces and it will also implicitly return the value. So what that means is if we make a function here like uh, const uh, my, my arrow equals an arrow function and we just put three, right? So now if I say var, let's say let a equals my arrow and we run it, oh yeah, it has already been declared, arrow return. Now if we log arrow return, it's three. So we didn't even have to put a return statement there because if it's a one line arrow function and there's no curly braces, it implicitly returns whatever value is there. If you put curly braces, you do have to put a return statement. So the difference there would be like cons my arrow curlies equals this return three. Now you can argue whether this is more readable or not. I don't want to get into that. Uh, <laughs> some people say there's a huge difference in readability. Oh yeah, I did already return. Whatever. Anyway, arrow return here, so this should still be three. Um, so in a lot of cases, if you're, the main benefit to me of arrow functions is when we get into the array functions that we've added uh, to this. So let's go ahead and move on from arrow functions to function parameters. 
Uh, the big thing that I know about the new function parameters is the rest operator that I already showed you earlier with spread. And you can add default parameters. So what that means is here we have function foo where we have a equals one and b equals two in the function parameters. Like what does that mean? What that means is if those come in as undefined, uh, not explicitly undefined, but if they're not passed in, actually I don't know what happens if you pass in. Oh, we'll find out here in a second. We'll try it. We'll learn together. If you pass, if it comes in as not, if it's not passed in, it will automatically assign that default value for you. So that can be really nice in cases where you have a function where like um, you want to be able to pass in optional parameters, but you have defaults. So in the example here, you can just pass in three. So A will get set to three, but B is set to its default value, which is two. And you can even do more complicated defaults where it's like config equals an object with some other stuff in it and like, uh, but I usually find that's a little too complicated and I do it manually because uh, I think it's easier to read, but you know, whatever. I'm not, I'm not the be all end all of the JavaScript world. That's, that's other people. Um, all right, so let's see what happens if we actually just do this and pass an undefined because I'm actually really curious now. <laughs> I don't know if it will overwrite it. Yet, I keep forgetting to name my functions. I'm a bad person. All right, so if we say, well, if we just call foo, right? And what if we do undefined? Oh, it does do that. Okay, so that's interesting. Uh, that is the behavior I expected, but I was not 100% certain. So that means you could actually pass an undefined and five, and it will do the default. So this, this is a nice way to guard against undefines if you don't want them to ever be undefined. Uh, I don't know if it'll do the same thing for null. I'm betting it won't. Yeah. Um, because null and undefined in JavaScript are two different things. All right. So that's the new thing you can do with function parameters. You can add some default stuff. That's really nice. In my opinion, it makes the language a lot tidier. Um, the reason is what you used to have to do was something like this. Um, let's just say foo guard, and we're going to pass an A and B. And what, what I used to do, and I think what most people used to do would be this, where A is equal to A. If A exists, so if A is not equal to undefined, then we return A. Otherwise, we return 1. And you did that for every variable. So the shorthand a equals one up in the function thing is just slightly easier to read. Uh, but most people actually don't do this. They do a thing that looks like this because this is shorthand. So because undefined when you, when you try to look at it is actually equal to false. So it falls through and says, oh, false is not true. So we just assign one to a. But of course, if you're coming from some other language, you don't know what this is doing. Like, this is crazy. So this is much clearer, <laughs> in my opinion. Um, yeah. So yeah, you can even do some, anyway, yeah. Don't do that stuff, unless you have to, which is fine. Uh, and that, that A or 1 is kind of a standard way to do that in JavaScript. So it may be a little confusing at first, but you will see that a lot. So kind of get used to that. Um, the next thing we're going to move on to is classes. So classes are syntactic sugar over prototypes, like I said earlier. So these are two ways to define a class and its constructor. What you used to do is you would define a function. Uh, and any function could, you could use as a constructor for a class. You still can, technically. You can just call new. And all new really does is it a, so remember when we were talking about this earlier and the context and everything? If you call a f new and then a function, instead of this being the window and the thing, it would just be an empty object because it says, call a function but set its inner context to this empty object. So what we can do then is we can attach 
new methods onto its prototype. So that means if we say new my thing, it creates a my thing with an empty context, but it has a prototype of uh, an object that has a property called foo on it. And what that means is if you tried to call foo on an instance of my thing, and it doesn't see my thing on this, I'm sorry, if it doesn't see foo on this, it will say, hey, does, does my prototype have a function called foo? Because that's probably what they meant to call. And if, if it does, it will call it. If it doesn't, it will ask its prototype. And it will ask its prototype all the way up to the window. Uh, not the window because this, in this case, the context doesn't prototype from the window. It prototypes from something. I guess an empty object is the root. I honestly don't know. Um, but anyway, we could actually find that out too if we wanted. So let, let's just uh, come in here. We're going to say function my thing, right? And we're going to say this dot a equals one. So now we're going to say var thing equals new my thing. And we can say thing dot a, right? And a is one. Cool. So what is thing here? Thing is an object that is a type my thing. As a prototype, that's an object. There's a constructor. And this prototype just keeps going down. Yeah, and that looks like all it is. So there is a root constructor that has all these things on it. So we can see here, it has all this stuff, right? So we could actually say uh, foo dot, we can see all of the, the, op, the, all of the options off of its prototype all the way up to the root prototype. So when I said, JavaScript is object oriented, but it's prototypal. That's what I mean. Uh, there are, there's like, it, it is an inheritable chain of functions and stuff that it will try to look up the parent chain, just like if you were inheriting in an object oriented language. It's slightly different in some cases, but in general, it's pretty, it's a pretty clean way to think about that. So in ES6, we added this keyword called class that kind of makes it a little easier to, to read what's going on. And the only thing for me that's nice about this is instead of having this myThing.foo.prototype that's kind of outside the declaration, it moves everything into the curly braces for the class declaration. So you can be like, easily see this is all owned by the class, right? And I mean, in the other case, yeah, it's about the same. Um, but at the same time, you know, to me, this is, this is a lot cleaner to read. Um, all right, so we went over that. Uh, this is a thing we've added in ES6 called getters and setters. What this does is when we set the value a by saying like my class dot a equals three, it will actually pass that value into our set a function so that we can modify it before we store it. Let's pretend that we have a thing called first name. And when set first name gets called, we will always want to capitalize the first letter. We don't want to trust the user to do that because, yeah. Um, so we can have a thing that anytime you put in a first name, the first letter gets capitalized and we store that. Uh, we could also do something where it's like, oh, we store how they typed it in, but we return it capitalized. Um, other things you could do is like, is let's say we wanted to keep, I don't I can't think of something. Um, you know, there, there are other use cases for this. I'm sure you can imagine good use cases for that. What git does is if you, when you define this git and set thing, it actually creates a property on the class. So in this case where we have git b, we can actually now say my class dot b, and it will return whatever calculated value there is. If you try to do my class dot b equals something, it will throw an error and tell you there's no setter for b. You can't, you can't set the value because there's no way to set it. Because the property doesn't actually exist. Um, so that's, that's the basics of what getters and setters do. Um, these are nice ways to do some like data validation and input cleanup, output cleanup, stuff like that. Um, I have used this in a few cases where like, uh, I want my thing to look like an array, 
where it has a length property, but I calculate the length with a function. Uh, so it's like my, my magical array thingy. And then you can make a new one, and then you can say my thing dot length, and it behaves the same way as an array would. So you can kind of like do some nice stuff where you could make it array-like. Um, all right, we're gonna talk about modules now. Uh, basically, no one said they really use Node that much, so I'm gonna talk about what this does real quick, and then we're gonna talk about the slight differences with the S6. So, what a module is, is a file. <laughs> it is another script file. Or it is a, mm, yeah, we'll call it that. <laughs> it is a script file that can also point to other modules, which are also script files. So what this lets us do is, let's say you're writing a program in JavaScript and you wanna have a bunch of functions in one file, and then in another file you wanna call those functions. Because nobody wants to write one file that is like 10,000 lines long. I mean, people do. Uh, I'm not gonna tell them they're wrong. But this lets you reuse these things more. So, what this does is, in this case, we have a module where we have a function called my function, and then we module.exports equals an object where the object has two properties. Thing is my function, and bar is two. And in this case, what that says is, when someone requires this file, the things that I give you back as a module are the things on this object, or is this object. So you can see down here where I say const mod, which I'm just using a shorthand for module, require my func. So let's pretend that there's a file on disk called myfunk.js. This will go load that and then grab the thing out of the module that exports and assign it to mod. So then we can say mod.thing and call the function from another file. So this is really nice because this is how NPM works. So if you want to get a whole bunch of nice functions that other people wrote so you don't have to write them, you can go get all that stuff from NPM. Um, modern stuff with NPM also supports a browser module which lets you write code and export it slightly differently for the browser to use. So if you're using something like Browserify or Webpack or Bower or any of these front end things that will let you use node modules on the front end, you can actually publish reusable front end components on NPM and reuse them. So there's lots of stuff for React on there, like uh, let's say you want a draggable sortable list. I know there is a thing called React sortable on NPM you don't need to rewrite that. You just go pull in the module and use it. It's great. So this part's a little confusing, but if I think this is pretty clear as to what this is doing, the main difference with modules in ES5 and ES6 is syntax. I think there may be a few other little things that it does, but syntax is mostly it. Um, so in ES6, Instead of saying module.exports equals something and putting your individual properties on it, you can actually just say export. And then inside of another file, we can import our, uh, our, um, our module. And here we're using the destructuring arguments again. So if we want my funk and bar off of the module that we imported, we're just importing those destructured variables from the module. Or we can say import star as mod from the module. And what that does is it says anything that got exported from that module, grab it and shove them all onto this object I want to call mod. So in that case, it behaves exactly the same. And so far as I know, it behaves exactly the same as the, the ES5 modules imports. And finally, we have a thing where we can say export default. And what that lets us do is we can do this where we export a function my func and then we export default in the same way that module.exports was. And that will let you import my func as a destructured thing or we can just say import mod from my func and it will set that default export to the variable mod. 
So that's nice because you can say, hey, if I want to import their whole library, I just import mod from the module. If I only want one function out of it, I can just grab that one function off of it with the destructuring arguments, which is really nice. Um, the reason that that's important is because some of these uh, pre-build tools like Webpack and et cetera can actually detect when you do this and only pull that code in. So your front end code can be, instead of having to compress it or do weird stuff, it will literally tree shake and only pull in that code you used. Uh, and it does this recursively, so if their code pulls in code and their code pulls in code, it will do it all the way up and yeah, it's pretty magical. Um, all right, so the next thing we're gonna talk about is data structures. Does anybody know what a set and map are in data structures? Does, does anyone not know what set and map are in data structures? Okay, so set and map are the two core data structures and then there's a thing called weak set and weak map. They're very similar but they're different enough to where we have to talk about them. A set, when we're talking about data structures, is a list of items where every item in the list is unique. Um, so you have an array where you can have, the array can have zero, comma, zero, comma, one, comma, one, comma, two in it. If you did the same thing with a set, it, would, it won't let you push um, the element into the set more than once. So even if you say like set dot add zero five times, you say like set, what do you have in you? It's like I have zero in me, that's, that's it. So that's really nice. Map is similar, but what map does is map uses that element as a key and a different thing as the value. So a good example of that would be, let's say you have an authorization system where a user sends in a token and you wanna associate the token with the user. Well, you could make an object and say like object array bracket key as string close array bracket equals user, or you can say map dot set token comma get the user from the database. Uh, and then if another token comes in that's matching, you just overwrite it. Or you can check if the map has it or not. Uh, and it actually the lookups and sets on maps are faster than doing it. They can be faster than doing it in an array. Um, depending on how you do it. Because if you imagine you have a list of tokens in an array, how do you find the token in it? You have to like do a search over the array. But in a set or a map, you can just say, does it have it? And uh, they use some internal hash tables. It's faster. Um, so the difference between a set and a weak set is kind of complicated and m probably won't matter for most people. Weak sets will allow the garbage collector to delete objects out of it if the object is not referenced anywhere else in memory. So what that means is if you have an object that you add to a weak set and it gets used in a function uh, and that function has a reference to it, like if you say like thing.a equals a new object and then you say weak set, oops, sorry, weak set dot add thing dot a. So thing dot a there is an object reference in memory. So JavaScript is always running in the background being like, what can I delete for you? Because back in the day browsers and stuff didn't have a lot of memory. I mean computers still have lots of memory but not as much as you think. It's easy to explode them. Um, so what a weak set does is when thing dot a goes out of scope, if it gets deleted or whatever, the weak set will, when the garbage collector checks, it will say, oh yeah, I have it, but you can get rid of it. So that's really nice for doing, dealing with stuff like um, uh, event handlers in HTML. That's, that's, uh, that was actually a big bug in IE, is that event handlers wouldn't get deleted properly. So if you ran a website for a while, like the website could be using gigs of RAM because you clicked on things. Like, but these, these other object types will help you deal with stuff like that. So weak map is the exact same. I keep forgetting to move my mouse. Weak map is the exact same, except it's a map, not a set. So the object would point to some value. Um, so 
These things are useful. I've used, I actually used Map and Set quite a bit recently for doing some like lower level data science stuff where I was building graphs and heaps and queues and stuff where it's like, oh, you know, have I looked at this element in a list? Well, how do you keep track of that? You just grab it and stuff it into a set. So, because like, you can't add it more than once. So if you if it's in there, you visited it. If it's not, then you're done. Right, so there's, there's some useful things for this. It makes it really, really uh, easy to use. Um, and these set and map are very common in most other languages, so it's kind of surprising that we didn't have them. Uh, now that being said, there's other stuff like queue and all that stuff that you can implement already using arrays. Um, so uh, if you've heard of a stack and a queue, JavaScript arrays are those already, if you call the right functions. <laughs> Um, so, the difference between a queue and a stack is a queue, when you push items into it, it, if you have a tube, a PVC tube, and you're putting tennis balls in it, after a while, you keep putting tennis balls in, they're going to fall out the other end, right? But the order that they fall out the end is the first ones you put into the tube are the first ones that come out of the tube, right? Now, the other thing is, if you go to a restaurant where they have those squishy plate things, and you stack the plates up, that's a stack. As you put things onto the stack, it, you push them down onto the stack, and when you pop them off, they come off the top. So the first ones in are the last ones out. So we call that FIFO and FILO, which are like fancy terms for either the tennis balls come out first or the plates come off the top. <laughs> this is how I, literally how I've always remembered this. Um, but Array can already do that if you use pop and push. So pop will add it onto the end, push pops it, I'm sorry, push puts it onto the end, pop takes it off the end. So JavaScript arrays are a stack. If you want to use it as a queue, you will have to either push it onto the end and shift it off the beginning, or if you want to reverse the way you're thinking about that, unshift it and then pop it. And that will make it go onto the beginning of the array and pop it off the end. So there you go, you got all your data science or data structures, done, down. Um, so finally, we're going to get into, oh boy, I got to speed up a little bit. All right, array functions. So we added a whole bunch of functions to arrays. You can now use array.from, which will create a new array from an array-like thing. So an array-like thing is either another array or a thing we call an iterable. So if you go to use a set or a map, and you're like, hey, I want to look at every key in my map, or every key in my set, you're going to be annoyed because when you do set.keys, you'll be like, oh, this surely returns an array, right? It does not. It returns an iterable, which is kind of like an array, but it's not an array. So if you say array.from map.set.key, or I'm sorry, set.keys, it will turn it into an array, and you can use it the same way you would use an array all the time. Uh, array.of just lets you create an array of array elements. So if you say array.of 1, 2, 3, 4, it will create that. Why would we use that? Well, sometimes if we want to combine multiple arrays or something like that, or if you have like 1, 2, dot, 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 rest, you can make an array out of all of those things again. Um, Array also has entries, keys, and values. Now, entries returns the key value pair out of an array. In most cases, that's going to just be the index and the value. Uh, well, I mean, in all cases, it'll be the index and the value. Arrays in JavaScript let you use string keys or object keys. So you can actually say array curly brace open string my array thingy equals three. So our entries will give you all those key value pairs. Keys will give you only the keys. Values gives you only the values. Um, now, if we have an in, the, these, the rest of these and those three are instance functions of an array. And what I mean by instance functions is they're not on the array class. They are on your array that you made. So if you say var r array equals close brackets, one, two, three, comma, you know. Uh, you can find elements, the first matching element. So this is why arrow functions are nice, right? You can see here we're just doing a pointy a greater than two. That will return the first element in the array that's greater than two. So you, that's like mm, shorthand, mm, real nice. 
if you want to find the index of the element, you can do the same thing. Uh, there is a new function called copy within. Most likely you're not going to use that. I'm about 80% sure they did that for WebGL stuff. Uh, because sometimes when you're writing WebGL stuff and you're copying textures around or vertex positions around, you want to copy them inside your array without resizing the array so it doesn't go slow. Yeah. Uh, you can do a thing called array.fill. So if you want to take all the elements in the array and set them to a value, you just say fill it with three. Make everyone, everything three. Um, I use that sometimes if I want to create an array that's a certain length and then fill it with um, some starting value. Let's say I have an array and I say array uh, 20 and I want to fill it with empty objects. Uh, so that can be useful sometimes. All right, so more functions. Array.map. So array.map is really, really useful. These three functions, map, reduce, and filter, are basically the three things that most functional languages use. It's going to get a little weird, but these things let you do all kinds of stuff. So let's say you wanted to add one to every value in an array. Usually you would do a for loop. With this, you can use a map function. You just say x pointy x plus one. So what that does is it takes every element out of the original array makes a new array, and then maps the original value to a new value based on the function return value. So array.map will not change the original array. This is nice because um, in functional languages, most of the time you want your arrays and stuff to be immutable. Um, these are also chainable because it returns an array. You can actually do array.filter some stuff, dot .map some other stuff. Uh, so map, reduce, and filter. What map does is it transforms one array to another, right? So if you want to take an array and then get a new array where every value is increased by one, you can do that with a map function. Filter returns a new array where they all match the condition given in the function. So I want to filter my array where all of them are odd. Like I only want odd numbers for my array. So that returns a new array of only odd numbers, right? Cool. Kind of confusing one is reduce. What reduce does is it takes all the elements in the array and reduces them to a single value. So I will show you how to write a sum example in this real quick because that's really the only one, well, that's the one I find confusing. Um, also the word filter bothers me because is it filtering out or is it like keeping stuff in? I don't. It's very confusing. Like if you say filter where A is greater than three, does that mean, and how I think of it is water filters filter out everything but water. So if it is water, we keep it. <laughs> That's literally the only way I can remember that. I don't, I don't know what's wrong with me, but whatever. All right, so we have an array here, and it's equal to one, two, three, four, five, okay? And we want the sum of this. So we're gonna say array.reduce, and we're gonna make an arrow function. If you have an arrow function with more than one parameter, you must put parentheses around the parameters. So we're gonna call this sum and cur. And what cur is, is this is the current element of the array that we're looking at. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna return sum plus current. And then we're gonna start sum at zero. So you can see here the, the, initial, the first parameter is the function, the reduce function, and the second parameter is the initial value for the thing that you're reducing into. So let's do that, and we get 15. So what, another thing that we could write with a reduce function is a flatten function, which say we have a list of arrays and we want to smush all the arrays into one array. So let's go ahead and write that real quick. I'm going to say var array equals equals a two-dimensional array of one and two, comma, two, uh, three and four, and then five, right? So really, the big difference is we're just going to say sum.concat cur, 
and it starts off as an array. So we're just grabbing every element out of the array and concatenating those arrays together into one array and returning it. So this is why reduce, if you think, reduce can be very, very confusing, but if you can think about it, it's a very, very powerful tool for doing all kinds of stuff. You could even do this with objects. You could have an array of objects where you smash all the objects together into one big object. I don't know why you would do that, but you can if you really want to, because power. Um, oh, and then on top of that, let's, let's go ahead and go back in here real quick. I want to show you one other thing. So let's do this. So we can do array.map x pointy x plus one, right? So what that does is it adds um, one to every element of the array. You can see the original array is unchanged, right? But what if we wanted to do that? If we want to do chaining, this is what I meant by chaining when I said this earlier. You can actually do this, right? And then we can say filter where they're less than four. And then finally sum all of those. So that's just really nice. You can just do so much stuff with this now. All right, so we have array functions. We went through map, reduce, filter. Forage is exactly the same as map, except it does modify, it can modify the original array, and it doesn't return an array. So it just says to run some function on every element. It doesn't really matter <laughs> what it is. Um, includes will return true if your element's in the array, but it can have some weird stuff. So let's go find out what includes does real quick because this confused me at first. So we have an array of objects. This first object is A is one. The second object is B is two, right? And we're gonna say dot array dot filter. No, we're gonna say array dot find. Wait, what was it? Wow, wow, okay, whatever. Um, includes, that's what it is, includes, right? Uh, does it include an object called with A1? No, it doesn't. Why does it do this? It does though, because it's right there, right? Well, those are technically two different objects because we made a new one when we said curly brace. So if we do it, that, that's the thing you have to be very careful about. So instead of using includes for objects, you should probably use find most of the time unless you have the original object reference. And that gets weird because you're talking about weak sets and weak maps and stuff again. But let's just make a normal array, right? Uh, an, a simple array of numbers. And if we say array.includes, two, we get true, right? That's nice. So that's, that's, that's a really nice thing to have. Um, Sum in every, uh, sum when you run this, it returns true if any element in the array matches it. So you're like, hey, I have this array. Is any element in it even? And it'll be like, yes, one of them is even. Doesn't tell you which one, I don't think, but it does tell you if one is even. And then every does the exact same thing, except every single element has to pass it for it to be true. So if you have a, an array and you wanna be like, I wanna make sure this array has nothing that's undefined in it. You can be like array.every x pointy x. And because it returns x, and if x is undefined, undefined's falsy, so it will return false if anything's undefined. So really nice, simple way. Uh, you can see here there's a link to the uh, MDM docs, which is the Mozilla developer docs on global objects and the more stuff you can do with arrays. All right, I have to speed up because we have two things left to cover. Okay, so promises. This is probably the most confusing thing that I'm talking about. What a promise is, is it is a thing that runs asynchronous code. Uh, if you run, used a set timeout before, you have used asynchronous code where you can say like, hey, please run this function in 500 milliseconds. Or 1,000 milliseconds, like I just said, right? So what that does is, it it will take the function and put it on this queue and it'll say, hey, we gotta look at the queue here in a little while and see if anything's supposed to be run. So what a promise does is it lets you kind of handle that stuff a little better. So what we can see here is I have const result equals new promise, resolve reject, pointy thing, set timeout, and then I'm calling resolve 
inside of the set timeout function. So what will happen is, I, down here I have result.then. So what then does is, it is a handler for when the promise gets resolved. So inside of our promise, we said, a thousand milliseconds later, please resolve this promise with the string cheese. And inside of our then, we're saying, when we get the result, or the resolve, then we're gonna run this function as a handler. If it threw an error, or if it was rejected, which rejecting it throws an error, then we're gonna catch the error and do something with it. All right? That's, that is promises. It's not too crazy. A promise can return a promise. So if you have a promise that returns a promise, and then that promise resolves, that will actually cascade all the way down and hit your then. That way you can actually do some crazy stuff like, I want to make a call to a REST API to get the user's token, and then I have to take that token and make a call to Gravatar and get the user's avatar, and once I have that, I have to make another call over to Twitter and get every single Twitter thing they've posted, finally grab all of that, and when all of that's done, then we're going to show them the UI, right? Trying to do that without promises and stuff is kind of a, yeah. <laughs> so what, we're, what we can do, though, is we can do stuff like this. So now, let's say we had those three promises, right? So we have the user's token, and we want to go fetch their Gravatar and every single Twitter request, or every, their top 10 Twitter posts, doesn't matter, right? If we put those in a promise.all, what that does is it says, I'm going to make a new promise, and I'm going to resolve myself when these two promises resolve. And I'm going to wait till all of them are resolved, and then I'm going to hand you all the values. So it's really nice, because you can actually send off parallel requests. And then when they all get back, we're going to do this one thing. Um, then there's another one called promise.race. I literally have no idea when you would use this. I can't think of a use case. But what it does is it waits for the first request to get back, and then it says it's done. So I don't, I don't know what that's for, but it's there. I'm sure someone will tell me, like, Ben, it's obvious. This, I don't know when you would use it. Anyway, so yeah, so that's really great. You can just tell it to wait for a promise to return, and then it will do your thing that you wanted it to do when it returned. So this is good because if you're on a, if you're on a web page and you click a button and you're waiting for some tweets to come back, you can still interact with the web page, and then when the tweets get back, they'll pop it into the DOM for you and like, here's your Twitter list. Um, this also lets you do things in parallel. So if you have a web page that's a blog, right, you want to load the blog posts and you want to load their Twitter posts and you want to add, load an ad, you can send those three requests out and then handle them separately when they get back. Right? That way it's more responsive. Um, this is more advanced coding stuff though, so don't feel bad if this is like a little like, I don't know what's going on. This is, this is like, the top JavaScript stuff. So this is the example I was just talking about. So you can make a function that returns a promise. Then you call the function. And then when that function, you can say result.then from the function, right? So all of this stuff, it's nice, but you got to do like result.then, result.catch, all this stuff. So a the people who made async await were like, we're kind of not into that. We want to make a different syntax because apparently that's what JavaScript's all about, is alternative syntax. So if you make a function and you put async before it, it says, I'm a promise now. So you can literally just call it and say dot then. So instead of having to say new promise, arrow function, resolve reject, you can just say return the value. Or you can say return promise.resolve with a value, and that will create a new promise and then resolve that newly created promise with the value you passed in. Uh, the reason you may want to do that is if you reject in here, you can either throw or you can just return a promise.reject. So that's nice. Uh, and then the await keyword, which you can use inside of async functions only, lets you say, instead of doing a promise.then and having this like deep function chain, you can just say, hey, just pause here until we get the value back. 
But because this function itself is asynchronous, it won't pause the rest of the JavaScript, right? So we'll, it'll just check back and it'll be like, hey, it's, it's the same as a then. So it won't freeze your script, but it will wait for that result to get back before it continues processing. So it's, it's, I find this syntax pretty nice, uh, but it can be confusing. Also, it's like, well, how do I await multiple things like the promise.all? What if I want to do it in parallel? Right? Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure there. All right. So that is the new stuff that happened in ES6. I don't know. Hopefully that was helpful for everyone. Uh, and if you have any questions, I can answer all of those questions. 